Can make signal. Okay. Shall I start? Okay. Cool. Hi, I'm Izzy. I'm I'm one of the paleo technicians at Neojaska. Um, and I mainly study dinosaur skin. But one of the things I find really interesting is paleoecology, dinosaur behaviour, and um, dinosaur sexual behaviour. So that's one of the things that I'm trying to move my way into. Um, and kind of a hot topic in that kind of sphere is sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs. Um, and this background, if you've seen prehistoric, um. Um, planet, you'll know the iconic scene with the carnivores and their mating dance. I thought it was a really nice image. Um, so what is sexual dimorphism? Um, sexual dimorphism is a condition in which males and females of the same species um, exhibit notably different uh, morphological characteristics. Um, so we see that a lot today and we see that in mammals. So we've got elephant seals, obviously males have that horrible squidward nose. And the, and the females are quite cute. Um, and lions also have a mane and no mane on male and female. And in birds, um, which are going to be the quite one we're going to have quite a heavy focus on today because obviously birds and dinosaurs are related. Um, we've got mandarin ducks. The males are obviously this really beautiful, highly, um, really bright plumage. And the females are a bit, sadly, quite bland. Um, and then the one on the right, which is a hornbill, is quite a nice one because it's actually like, like a structure, structure which could be fossilised. It's a keratinous beak structure. Um, so we see big um, diversity in that. And then we also see it in vertebrates. It's really present in like all areas of um, multicellular organisms, down to plants and fungi as well, but we haven't included them in this one. So you've got some lovely spiders, the ladybird spider, and also a species of butterfly. So as you can see, it's really rife and a kind of a homologous kind of thing to demonstrate all throughout the animal kingdom. And why do animals evolve sexual dimorphism? Essentially, is most of the time to ensure greater reproductive success for individuals, mainly males. We all see these lovely um, photos of birds of paradise doing their dances like this. The bigger, the better, evidently. They're quite fancy. Um, and that links to a lot of different um, ecological hypotheses in modern day studies of ecology and conservation, such as there's something called, we learned at a uni called the sexy boy hypothesis which is kind of the prettier, the more bright, the better, the more like they're going to get selected by a female for mating. And obviously linking back as well, these big um, differences also allow for sexual recognition um, through kind of interspecific variation at the male-female level within species and populations. So just being able to differentiate between male and female in a population. And then this is kind of linking those behaviours and how we can understand dinosaur behaviour from modern animal um, behaviour. So this is that lovely clip of the contours in prehistoric planet that will hopefully carry through. So as you can see, he's got these lovely blue colours underneath his arms that he's displaying to the female and wiggling his little nubbins around. And it's quite interesting it's quite because interesting. I don't think they've carried through like what is that demonstration for the female that he benefits at. Usually there has to be a kind of proof that that demonstrates some indicative better fitness of that individual over others. Um, we see this a lot with, with male deer, with antlers. The bigger the antlers, the more likely they're, they're going to be selected to breed because it shows that they're stronger in order to be able to survive with such a large ornamentation on their head and not be dated on or just be able to carry them and they have more energy and better fitness better to be able to do, to be so. Able to do so. So that's a really interesting way that we see that modern um, behaviour and ecology carries across into extinct taxa. And that's largely what we're going to be looking at today because we rely a lot on um, current morphologies to understand extinct morphology that we can't necessarily see or aren't preserved. So why can't we sex every single dinosaur skeleton we find? Why don't we see on when we go into the Naturalist Museum and we see Sophie in the corridor before you go up the escalators, why don't we see whether she's actually definitively a male or female? Um, as we've seen in the images previously, sexual dimorphism is expressed by variation in pr primarily soft tissues, skin, feathers, um, just a more expressed or bigger feature which won't fossilise because we don't see a lot of skin in the dinosaur fossil record or in any fossil record whatsoever. Um, 
And where we do get skeletons, that they're often not complete. That's really rare. We need a really specific taphonomic conditions in order to great, get a really great articulated, complete skeleton that's preserved well enough that we can actually get a sample size big enough to identify distinct variation between individuals within a population or within a bone bed. And also there's that, there's that typical thing that size doesn't necessarily indicate a specific sex. For example, as we saw with the spiders, males, much smaller than females. Whereas in, Whereas lions, in lions, or lions, lions there probably is a bit of a size difference between male and females, the males are bigger, bigger. and so and on and so, so forth. So there isn't a distinct correlation that you can actually see from just looking at bones. And then, and then because the sample size isn't big enough of dinosaurs, we don't necessarily know that size does equal anything apart from age, really, or just the size of that animal, what it could get to. So um, looking at sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs was started by a man called Franz Nox Noxer, and he was um, born in Transylvania, and this is literally like 1870s. This is really kind of a pioneering idea of the time, but unfortunately could not be executed because he didn't have the tools to execute it properly. So he was specifically looking at cranial diversity in hadrosaurs and ceratopsians to look at whether one of them could indicate um, male or female. Um, but obviously... They're so different and there's so many of them that we know are different species that it's kind of just this, this seems to be an interspecific variation or intraspecific variation rather than a sexual variation. Um, he looks at the sexual dimorphisms of, dimorphisms of modern animals as he believed that different shapes could indicate male or female. Um, however, this has been kind of disputed and again it's just that thing of just isn't particularly logical we've got some really beautiful ornamented animals here today that are just a bit more snazzy if they're males but there's still that kind of specific trait and morphology in females as well um he also had a i didn't put a photo on it because i didn't know if i was allowed but misidentified a sauropod clavicle bone as a uh, baculum which is a penis bone so there's lots of traits that could be carried through that we might just be missing because they've not been fossilized or we just, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of kind of diversity can also equal disparity. So there's massive gaps in the fossil record and data set that mean that we can't make logical findings sometimes. Well, this doesn't really work. So we'll get rid of that. So we're going to talk a little bit about ontogenetic variation as well as a way that can kind of mislead um, differentiation of species and also differentiation of male to female. So ontogenetic variation is when the phenotype, the morphology, like the external bits that you see, how you look, um, of a species varies and changes throughout their development and with age. So here we've got um, three distinct um, species of pachycephalosaur. So we've got Dracorex. Sigamolloch and Pachycephalosaurus. Um, these were previously described, or some people still do think, it's kind of all up to debate, all of this kind of research, um, as most things are. Um, these are thought to be as three different species of Pachycephalosaurus. They look quite different. They've got a different extent of ornamentation. They've got kind of different size skulls. So at first glance, these look like they might be three different species. Or could they be something else entirely and just be different growth stages of one type of dinosaur? So Horner and Goodwin in 2009, uh, this is a really cool paper. Whether you agree with it or not, you should really, there's a TED talk about it as well. It's really great. Basically looking at how paleontologists are so keen to name so many species of dinosaurs that sometimes they don't think that they could be less species, but just different stages of growth. Um, so... By looking at the histology and the size um, of the skull and the bony ornamentation of these different species, um, Horner and Goodwin found that the squamosal horns revealed evidence of rapid growth, rapid bone growth due to high vasculation. Um, and this was most prominent in Dracorex, which is the smallest one, which basically means the highest rate of growth is occurring in this animal. And then it's kind of medial here and the, and the bones and the ornamentations are medial in Stigmolic as well. And then they're slowest and largest in Pachycephalosaurus. Um, so by the, by the overall size and length of the cranial elements, um, Horner and Goodwin have found that Dracorex and Stigmolic may present young, younger ontogenetic growth stages of Pachycephalosaurus rather than all being three different species. Um, and this massively reduces like the diversity of taxa from upper Cretaceous assemblages that um, yield these dinosaurs. Um, but it is, even if it's not true, it's a really interesting kind of concept of how we approach science and publishing different animals and how we regard those species and their morphology. So whilst previously there might have been three different species of Pachycephalosaur, 
we've now got what we think is juvenile, sub-adult and adult, which is quite cool. So here we see the fact that morpho morphological diversity amongst fossils does not always indicate taxonomic diversity. So why could it not be the same thing for sexual diversity? Ergo, diversity, they don't have to be distinctly different in order to be able to identify. There could just be ways that you can't, they might look very similar and then you can't really tell. So a good example of that is Protoceratops andrusi. These are really, really cute little ceratopsians. Um, and they were previously thought to exhibit sexual um, dimorphism in the shape of the cranium, both by how wide it is and how long it is and how deep different um, portions of it are, especially in the frill and the nasal horn and the frill. Um, so yeah, this is a previous, previously dictated male and female. So the male's on the right, on the left and the female's on the right. And as you can see already, we're kind of seeing what could just be a bias towards smaller and larger indicating whether male or female. So this was this was previously allocated as um, male or female animals. Actually, they're actually quite small skulls. The scale bar is 10 centimetres, so they're only about 50 centimetres in length. So they're, they're really cute, small ceratopsians. Um, so I'm not sure how to pronounce their name. Mayorino um, et al. 2015 basically found that um, when you take a larger sample size of these animals and run it through um, an a PCA analysis, they occupy very similar spaces in the graph. And then the juveniles are kind of the outliers here. So the juveniles might look very different, have different morphologies to the adult, but the quote unquote male and female identified ones don't actually occupy very different spaces um, morphologically. Um, but it is, this is really hard stuff to test using modern statistical methods because it is essentially down to the fossils that we have. So it's really hard stuff to actually quantify and use tests to determine. But really interesting that when you apply different um, stats to it, you yield different results. So it's like, what is the most um, parsimonious results, really? So we can get rid of this as well. And the other thing is that we can look at whether an animal is male or female by um, the fact that these oviraptors were found on their nest, nesting, the fossil is with the eggs beneath the animal. Um, so some people have thought, oh, this could be a female animal, it's could be a mother tending to her eggs. But we see a lot of cases of biparentalism in modern birds as well. So what's to say that this could not be a male also tending to, um, to their clutch? So how can we actually sex dinosaurs? There's a lot of ways that there's a lot of metrics that people are using to kind of hypothesize ways that you can, but what are actually some fairly stable ways of doing it? So this isn't a definitive diagnosis. This is a really cool and really rare case that could lead to some really cool findings for dinosaur skin, physiology, and like sexting them. Um, so Cetacosaurs, we have one in the gallery actually if you want to head out and look at him later, he's really cute, he's called Frank. Um, Cetacosaurs are these basal ceratopsians um, and they were just everywhere in like Asia um, when they were around and we find mass deathbeds of them, we find juveniles with, with older individuals. They're really, really common and they're really cute and gorgeous. And they actually, um, a Cetacosaurus that was published in 2022 um, by Bell et al is one of well, is the best animal that we have with preserved skin in the fossil record. It is literally covered in this image, top tail with feathers on it. So we immediately know this animal had both feathers and skin localised to different areas. Um, and it also has a preserved cloaca. So we've got, for one of the first times, an actual possible sex slash waste organ in a dinosaur preserve. Um, and the analysis that they did actually ran it. And like morphologically looking at um, the structures, outlined it to be very, very close to what um, a crocodilian cloaca would look like. So there's that kind of um, homologous structure there. Um, it doesn't necessarily get us any closer to sexing it, but there might be more um, morph metrics that we can apply to it to kind of get to a greater le layer um, level of identification. But I just think it's so cool that we've got this to add to the fossil record, add to our data sampling moving forwards to look at this type of thing. So, so to the long and short of it is, genitalia can tell us whether they're male or female. We just need to greater understand the differentiation between the two and order. And that might be through studying modern archosaurs like birds and crocodile cloacas and then transfer those findings over. That's probably the, the, the way that we're going to have to go in order to do that. But that is a good way to be able to do it when we get there. This is quite a cool study on Stegosaurus by Sater Saita. Um, he was a student at Bristol um, this is in 2015. Um, 
And this is basically looking at the dermal plates of stegosaurus and how the shape of them might indicate male or female. So the um, sexual dimorphism in the ornamentation of the bony plate. Um, and they found, he found that um, it was not a result of ontogenetic variation. So not, a, not an indication of, they weren't different because of age. They weren't different um, because of just um, genetic variation in the population, um, but most likely a sexually dimorphic feature. Um, but you can see like, um, they are vastly different in kind of their shape in both axis. Um, and they were, and they were, there were plates so yielded from the same, I can't remember what part of the body, but they were yielded from the same part of the body of two individuals from the same quarry that died in the same um, sediment layer. So they were from the same population at the same time, from different animals in the same body place. So it wasn't just from different parts of the body that there was variation. It wasn't um, due to that. And when they plotted them on the morphous space, they kind of cluster in two different areas. Um, so. Yeah, the toponymy of the quarry, um, which yielded the specimens, indicated that the individuals coexisted within the same population, so it wasn't just two different animals from different um, sediments um, or different um, fossil, fossiliferous layers. And histological work provided evidence against the genetic variation, so the animals were within the same age. So it's not just down to different um, ages or stages of growth like in the pachycephalosaurs. So this is kind of what we found, is that, well, what we found, kind of, what he found is that the females had the more rounded plates and the men, the females had the more spiky plates and the males had the more rounded plates. Um, best way to kind of um, actually detect distinct, literally be able to tell if a dinosaur is male or female is a detection of a dullery bone. So this is really present in birds um, and it is ephemeral endosteal bone tissue known only in female birds. So that means it's temporary. It's only present when a female is laying eggs or about to lay eggs. And it's essentially reserved for the creation of the calcified um, hard eggshell. Um, so as you can see, it's literally in the middle and it has a very, it looks very different to spongy bone. You can see the compact bone layer on the outside and then it looks very different um, to um, spongy bone. And this is just, a nice phylogeny which kind of represents that it is a distinct shape within archosaurs. So archosaurs um, between um, between birds and theropod dinosaurs and just dinosaurs as a whole, um, because it's not present in crocodilians, which are obviously archosaurs, but they're an outgroup and more distantly related. Birds are a distinct um, descendant of dinosaurs. So medullary bone is present in all but all dinosaurs that we've got it data for and it's always present in all birds so it's likely that it was a distinct characteristic throughout the whole clade especially because we've got it in ornithischian and um, sauriscian dinosaurs so this is a really nice paper by schweitzer um, et al in 2005 um, mary schweitzer does some really cool stuff looking at um looking at possibly the detection of dna in um, dinosaur bones and dissolving um bone away to kind of look at white blood, blood cells and stuff within T-Rex bones. So some really cool stuff. Um, images D and G, so these ones outlined by the green by the green box, show medullary bone in um, Tyrannosaurus rex specimen more 1125, also known as B rex. Um, and then the other images are medullary bone present in emus, hens and ostriches. So it's, so it's this kind of very distinct layer um just um within the compact bone so it's quite a distinctive trait that you can identify and that that basically tells you that your specimen is female but obviously there's that very weird window of it has to have died when it's about to lay eggs or whatever and this is just another photo that this is a nice one that kind of shows you distinctly that how you can distinct it from compact bone and this is from schweizer et al 2016 just continuing that research a little bit uh, and this is a really cool paper, which basically, um, it was typed with something ridiculous, like um, teenage dinosaurs were also susceptible to teenage pregnancy. Um, and essentially, this is a sub-adult um, Tenontosaurus, I believe, um, that was found with medullary bone in its, um, in its femur. Um, and also the growth lines were not adults. So it was a sub-adult um, individual breeding, which is, is interesting because it brings down kind of like at what point were these animals reaching sexual maturity? So being able to assimilate growth data and age data into that as well is really interesting. So to conclude, 
did animals, did, animals, did dinosaurs did actually animals exhibit animals sexual dimorphism? Probably. <laughs> um, we don't know without skin and we don't know without being able to detect colour of skin and we don't know without a larger data set. So being able to apply all of these traits into the data that we already have is our best way going with, with regards to looking at skin and looking at bone structure. Um, but because we see it so variably in, bo in birds and birds carry across so many homologous structures through the archosaurs themselves from dinosaurs into what they are now, it's very likely that those behaviours and those traits are so deeply rooted in the genome. Things like feathers are so deeply rooted in the genome that there must have been variation in them to some extent. So that's kind of the conclusion, but the research behind it is really, really cool. And I hope, hope you enjoyed it.